I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. So this is our fourth episode for our October 2020 Halloween theme month. We are watching the 1922 film Nosferatu, which of course was a sequel to the extremely successful Nosferat, or not. Uh, it could be some kind of foreign word for a vampire, if that's what it is. This film was selected by Rob. And Rob can yes. explain why he selected for us to view this film. So I was intrigued by this film, especially after having watched Nosferatu the Vampire earlier this year when we did our Werner Herzog, Werner Herzog Month. This was a 1979 Herzog West German release. Yes. I really just thoroughly enjoyed that film to an extent that it intrigued me about the original 1922 a silent film. And then later on, I learned that it is frequently taught in film appreciation courses. And it just had me hooked. You know, I wanted to see it. I wanted to have an understanding and an appreciation of it. And I thought, what better time to watch it than in October when we're doing horror films? Yeah. And this, of course, was your time, first time seeing it. I had seen it once before in 2011. Yeah. And, of course, I've seen the uh, Herzog remake a number of times. What are your thoughts, your first thoughts? Now, now actually, I'm going to go back and around for a moment. Silent films. You're not a silent film guy. This is I, like your first feature-length silent film? This is my first full feature-length silent film. I've watched shorts, mm -hmm. and I have watched portions of other silent films. But this is my first time actually sitting down all the way through start to finish of a silent film. And this film is not particularly long. It's an hour and 19 minutes. Yeah. But relatively long for a silent film of the time. Not that there weren't much longer films like uh, Birth of a Nation or Intolerance. There used to be just massive epics. Uh, but the majority of them were probably shorter, even the non-shorts, than what we're used to today. But what, how was that experience for you, sitting through a silent film for that long? It was interesting. This one, of course, is probably a slightly different beast than, than most other silent films, just with the nature of the you know, what the film deals with and things like uh, things of that nature. But yeah, I enjoyed the, the organ music. I enjoyed the score. We can talk a little bit about it. It was score. well composed. The, the whole film was well composed. It, it paces itself very well. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And we'll talk a little bit about some differences between this and the uh, 79 version. We had some questions uh, about the score and about silent scores generally, and you were able to find out some information on that online. Yeah, one of the questions I had as we were watching this is, were silent films shipped with a score for the organist to play? You know, what happened? And it turns out it was kind of a mixture. Sometimes that they were shipped with a score for the organist to follow. Sometimes it was a pianist, and in larger cities, actually, it was an orchestra that would play along with them. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they were shipped with a score, and other times it was improvised. I did not see definitively if this was shipped with a score, uh, but I'm going to kind of presume that it was. The score that was included in this uh, was fine. It was very organ-y at first, but then it moved into something else, I think. I thought that was still an organ all the way through uh, okay. the end, just changed up the keys. Uh, it could be. Yeah. It didn't seem as over overwrought at times. It, it was less heavy-handed, that's yeah. for sure. So this film uh, was directed by a man named F.W. Murnau, who's a big name in silent films. I have seen at least one other film that he'd made. Uh, he was uh, from Germany. But he didn't make all of his films in Germany. He actually was lured over to Hollywood in the late 20s, just before the end of silent filmmaking, to make some films there. Yeah. And the film he made there that he's probably most famous for, other than this film, Nosferatu, was... Sunrise, A Tale of Two Humans, which is uh, kind of a romance drama film that won an Oscar during the original Academy Awards for the first and only time there were two Best Picture winners that initial year. So there was one that was the Best Picture, basically popular favorite, and what is still recognized when you see list of the Oscar winning films, the first Best Picture winner, which was Wings, which is I've also seen, which is a World War I aircraft film, which is okay pretty good visually for, for the time. And then they had this other award for best film, best artistic achievement. And that went to Sunrise. Murnau made a number of different types of films. He was apparently rather taken with both mysteries and horror films. And he was also taken with unauthorized remakes because before making this film, he made an unauthorized version of 
Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And so he liked to take these properties and uh, alter them enough to get by the demands of copyright in Germany at the time. Uh, when this film was shot, while it was based on Bram Stoker's Dracula, I guess originally it did not recognize it and changed some of the character names, but later a lawsuit happened, which caused a fun fact that you found. So all known prints and negatives of this film were destroyed under the terms of a settlement of a lawsuit with Bram Stoker's widow. However, the film would subsequently surface through second generation reels in other countries. So that's how uh, this came about and all of those. So if you ever see this film, it's restored from a second generation reel that came from another country. Talk about some differences between this film and the uh, later Herzog film. Yeah. So there's a number of sequences that are in this that are not in the later film. And of course, certain things are expanded yeah. in that film or, or shortened or vice versa. There's an interesting sequence uh, where they use what appears to be microscope photography. Yeah. Where Dr. Van Helsing is showing a class, various carnivorous life forms, including Venus flytrap and this tiny little polyp thing that they view under a microscope. There's a sequence where Nina... Do we, do we even need to really go over the, the plot? This is the vampire plot, the Dracula plot. So there's a guy who goes to the Carpathian Mountains to try to sell a house to Dracula, who keeps him locked up there. And then Dracula goes to the town where the man's from and uh, is very taken with his wife. And he introduces the plague with him because when he goes up by ship, he brings a bunch of plague-ridden rats with him. Uh, that descend upon the town, keeping the town paralyzed, presumably, so it's easier for him to go about his blood-sucking ways. So uh, Nina, the uh, wife of Jonathan Harker, our, our nominal lead, waits among the dunes by the shore for her husband. That's not in the remake, to my memory. There's a prolonged sequence where they're going through the captain's log on the boat and p putting together what happened to the ship and why everybody was dead when the ship arrived. There seems to be more stuff with Renfield, the boss, in this one than in the other one, which I don't know how well that worked. There's some famous cinematography in this, the shot of Nosferatu's shadow going up the stairwell to Mrs. Harker's quarters is quite famous. The whole makeup that they did on Max Schreck, who's really the only name uh, in the cast really worth noting. Uh, uh, besides perhaps uh, Harker, who is Gustav Van Wagenheim. And then, of course, the woman who plays uh, Nina, which is Greta Schroeder Ellen. So this film is often referred to, and, and horror films of the time from Germany, as expressionistic. And probably the, the best example of that is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is very expressionistic in its sets and its acting. This film isn't really. This film is pretty much plays it straight, with the exception of the vampire, who is a very expressionistic character, smack dab it in an otherwise realistic looking film, yeah. which is an interesting choice. What did you think of this film the first time you saw it? I think I appreciated it more than necessarily enjoyed it. I did see this before I saw the Herzog version, which is obviously the opposite of your ex experience. You know, it's, it's a film that I just don't think I can, I can't really see it in the eyes of someone who saw it in 1922. Sometimes you can kind of divorce yourself and do that, but I just, find that I can't for this. Like, I can appreciate the visuals and how innovative this would have been for the time, but it is just kind of there in some respects when you watch it now. It's not particularly gripping, and the visuals are good, but the real memorable ones are pretty spread out. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think that this probably... I think it's safe to say that this benefits from having seen... Nosferatu the Vampire, the 1979 version, before having seen this. Mm. Uh, I think it certainly benefits because if you enjoyed the 1979, you're familiar with the story, you're you're familiar with some of the visuals, and, and it allows it to be a little more captivating. And I would say the remake is, at least of modern audiences, uh, the more captivating. Film. Yeah. Well, and, you know, there are shots that... You can certainly tell the shots that Werner Herzog that uses or creates in his remake that are homages to this, like the ship sailing at sea. Yeah. You know, and a few others, you know, some of the shadow shots. And he that generally nature. improves upon them. Yes. And part of that is 50 years of increased 
filmmaking technology. Yep. It also gives me more appreciation for the scenes Herzog does in the Carpathian Mountains, mm. which when I first watched Nosferatu the Vampire, I didn't fully appreciate those scenes. I now have a greater appreciation for those scenes. Because of how seen this basic one. they are here. Yeah. Not only how basic they are here, but the fact that he chose to flush those out, and he does so in a manner that creates suspense. Did you know that there is a film about the making of this film? No, I did not. It's a movie from 2000 called Shadow of the Vampire, which is a which I've not seen, but which has a pretty strong reputation, and it's a weird hybrid. It is a behind-the-scenes making of film that also postulates that the vampire was really a vampire. That Max Schreck, uh, who in that film is played by John Malkovich, hires, or F. F. W. Murnau, Murnau who is played by Malkovich, hires Max Schreck, who is played by Willem Dafoe, an actual vampire, to play the vampire in his movie. Intriguing. Uh, looking online, it's got better ratings than I would have thought a film with that plot would have. Yeah. Apparently it works pretty well as both a vampire movie and a behind-the-scenes filmmaking yeah. movie. And the guy who plays the uh, Jonathan Harker character, the Gustav van Wagenheim, Wagenheim is played by Carrie Ewells. That's interesting. I might have to look that up and see yeah. if it's where it's available. That would be intriguing to watch at some point. Yeah. Maybe we, yeah. Maybe we do that next year. That might be interesting. <laughs> yeah. We continue to beat this horse. Yeah. Uh, did you know that this movie was banned in Sweden for its excessive horror? Uh, no, that's interesting. Yeah. The ban was not actually lifted until 1972. Oh, wow. I'm assuming that's one of those oversight Oversights. type of things. But, yeah, it was banned in, in uh, Sweden. It's a long-lived senior member of the film board that refused to budge. Uh, one thing that you kind of... There was something you kind of made some comments on as this film progressed that I have a little bit of an answer to. All right. You may not have even realized that this was what you were getting at in your comments, but some of the scenes featuring Graf Orlock were filmed during the day, and when they were viewed in black and white, become ex this becomes extremely obvious that it had been filmed during the daytime. Yeah. This potential blooper was corrected when the official versions of the movie were tinted blue to represent night. Mm. So... Yeah, you sometimes have a hard time in this film telling what's supposed to be day and what's supposed to be night. I mean, I guess the giveaway is if Orlock is moving about, then it's nighttime. Yep. Except for the end, when, when he is killed by the daylight. Also, the the sense of time is not great in this film. You don't have a real sense about how long you know, yeah. Orlock away. How the, long that boat voyage is. Yeah, the very last night was totally off because all of a sudden it's day. It's like, wait, I thought it was like two in the morning, and now it's day? It was like, what, what happened? Werner Herzog has uh, been quoted, I guess, in an interview in 1998. Uh, he said that he feels like this is the greatest German film ever made. Oh, the original. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it you know predated by about a decade the uh, Hollywood Bela Lugosi version, which is arguably still the most well-known, at least in the United States. Uh, apparently, there was also another version of this film released in the late 1990s that replaced the film's score with the music of a metal band, Typo Negative. This film was introduced by the late David Carradine. Hmm. So. That had been done before. Uh, another silent film, Metropolis, was colorized, colorized and re-released in the early 80s with a kind of a punk metal soundtrack of course you're a big fan of roger debert this was apparently on his list of greatest movies mm. who who all would you recommend this film to well probably people that are really interested in cinema history people that are complete us you know it's not i'm i would assume that to your experience this wasn't a bad choice for first silent feature uh, i wouldn't say that it was a bad choice no uh, honestly for me if someone watched the 1979 uh, Nosferatu to the vampire and enjoyed it I would say this would be worth their time to check this out again this is a frequently taught in like film appreciation courses so if you're into something of that nature I would say this would be worth watching it's really a film to see to say that you've seen it yeah. I think more than to necessarily enjoy it uh, I think it was it was enjoyable enough but I, that's coming at it from the perspective of having seen and loved Nosferatu to the vampire I don't know if I would have enjoyed this nearly as much if I had not seen Nosferatu the Vampire first. What would you rate it? 
I would I would probably rate this on the four star scale. I would say it's a solid three stars, and on the ten star scale, I would probably give it eight stars. Mm -hmm. I would probably give it three on the four star scale. It really felt like more of a two and a half in terms of level of enjoyment, but I going to push it up there because of its historical significance and on the 10 star scale i'd probably give it a six or a seven yeah it's it's a classic though it's not I, I don't think i need to see it again yeah i i would i would agree with that i've seen it i don't know that i need to see it again although if someone was really interested in seeing it you know who had never seen it before i would probably watch it again for, for that purpose i did that um <laughs> yeah <laughs> But yeah, it, I, I would not be opposed to watching this again, but I don't think I'd go out of my way to watch mm. it again. So it is available on Amazon Prime. So if any of our listeners are interested in watching this, I would not say that it would be a waste of your time to go and watch it. So Yeah, and you got to appreciate the performance from Max uh, Shrek, who a lot of people thought died of a heart attack in 1936, but actually went on to be the mayor of New York and is currently the president's lawyer. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And this is Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. A nice Giuliani reference. Indeed. Yeah. You had to get it in. Where did that come from? Have you not seen the memes that have pictures of, of Nosferatu and Giuliani next to each other? No, they, they, I haven't seen any of these. They basically the same. No. You, know, you didn't notice that uh, resemblance? No. Shows up, uh, I think uh, Seth Meyers makes that joke a lot. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. All right, on to Slumber Party Massacre. <laughs>